So, Heavenly Father, we open our hearts today for your word to speak to us. And, Lord, we don't want to just say, oh, that makes sense. We really do want to have a life that's improved, enhanced, refreshed, and above all, honoring to you. So, Lord, do that today. While we open the word, we open our hearts in Jesus' mighty name. Amen? Amen. Well, I just want to highlight we are in part four. It's our series that's entitled Growing Useful Character. Character that God could use us, and one of them we saw was self-discipline. How many know if a person that's really highly being used by God, they're probably extremely self-disciplined? Well, today the message is entitled, Develop Optimism to be Useful. Develop Optimism. We're looking at that. Want to start? Heard a cute story. An atheist and a Christian were dialoguing. And the atheist came up and says, you know, a lot of the stories in the Bible are so difficult to understand and really believe. And so the Christian said, well, what story exactly would you refer to? He said, well, how about, the atheist said, about this guy Jonah being in the belly of the big fish for three days? The Christian said, yeah, absolutely, that's a tough one to explain. And, and the Christian said, I can't wait to ask what that was like when I see Jonah in heaven. So the atheist said, well, how do you know he's in heaven? So the Christian said, if he isn't, then you ask him. <laughs> okay, well, you explain that to somebody. We're taking a look at develop optimism to be useful. We're living in a world that's hard. It's filled with challenge, filled with disappointment and pain. How is it that we can keep ourselves from becoming cynical or pessimistic people? How do we keep ourselves from actually somehow being calloused or hard-hearted or difficult to even just be around and all of a sudden become a negative individual? When we start to see really evil is at an all-time high and pain seems to be everywhere we go. There seems to be those areas that how do we keep that back from affecting us or affecting us within? That's really what we're taking a look at, developing optimism. And when we, I think we all know people who are negative. And they're kind of pessimistic. They're the glass half empty kind of person. That individual that comes along and you just know, it's like, wow, what happened to you? I remember when I was a younger man as a Christian, especially as a youth pastor, and coming across people that were older than me and they were negative, I was highly critical of them. And I've got to say that is it's just what was it that made them that way? What made that individual such a pessimistic, hard person? I remember when I was water baptized at age 19, it was shortly thereafter I had a nice elderly woman come up to me and said, oh, dear brother Paul, it is my responsibility to tell you that your joy will not last forever. <laughs> it's like fingernails on a chalkboard. And, and I turned around and I said, dear Jesus, take me home now if that's the case. <laughs> what is she talking about? So looking at people that have lived long, it seems like they become harder and more negative in their approach. Pain and hardship and brokenness takes its toll on all of us. And as I become older, I understand. I start to see, it seems like somewhere along the line, age certainly gives us a different perspective. I'm a little more compassionate now to people because <laughs> I'm arrived. And we have to be careful what all of a sudden, because it can be so tough to stay positive the older we get. So if you're a young person right now, this message is for you and for you who may be in that area, that vortex saying, oh, life's a rock and I don't know if I want to be with anybody. Then God brought you here for a purpose. So today we're going to be taking a look at how we can develop character quality called optimism. I want God to use us. I want God to use us and he will. Optimism, as we see on the screen, says this, the quality of being full of hope and emphasizing the good parts of a situation. Or 
a, brief, a belief that something good will always happen. So it's always an attitude that, listen, there's going to be something good that's going to be a part of this, or it's going to end up with something good that's going to happen. That's optimism. When we look here, and I want to just say, optimism defines the followers of Jesus. If you're going to say that person's a Christian, then this is one of those developing character qualities. <laughs> it just has to be in us to be able to say, wow, that definitely is a believer because optimism really goes and equates with both faith and hope. You can't really have faith and hope without being optimistic. They really go hand in hand together. And the Bible may not use the word optimism, but it describes it in so many places. Let's look in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It's on the screen as well in case you don't have it. But it says, and we know that God causes everything to work together uh, of those who love God and are called according to the purpose or for his purpose for them. So God causes everything. We know this. It's something... Now, the harshness of life cannot rob me. It won't personally. The harshness of life cannot rob me of experiencing the goodness of God. That's optimism, isn't it? I refuse to let that happen. And I've had some Lulus hit the wall. But it's important for you and me because it's a pattern of a Christian to say, Lord, I know you're going to work this through. Here are six practical ways. We're going to take a look at them. I hope you'll enjoy the journey today. Number one, uh, practice gratitude in all circumstances. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18. Practice gratitude and look at the word all circumstances. It says it right here in the Bible. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Now, look at that verse because let's not miss the fact it's God's will for Christians to be thankful. Everybody see that? It's significant for us. We don't want to miss that. So one of the defining qualities of believers is that they're going to give thanks. Doesn't mean you have to be thankful for things, but in the midst of that, you are thankful. Now, good can happen to us and it triggers things and makes us happy and give gratitude, but many times Things don't always work that way. That's what we're talking about in our society these days. It seems like things are so difficult that people are finding a hard time to be a Christian and give thanks in all circumstances. Well, let me give you two practical ways. You can write them down. Here we go. Are we thankful for our everyday blessings? Are we thankful for our everyday blessings? You just need to write that down. We didn't give that to you on your notes. You're going to determine that. When was the last time you just took time to thank God for things that you might take it for granted? Nobody, I certainly don't want to be one that acts entitled to these things. Like, thank you, Lord, for the electricity. Thank you, Lord, for the air conditioning. Lord, I'm grateful for the new dwelling place you've given to me. Or if you're able to buy a home. Lord, thank you for these things where I'm able to see a good job or great relationships that you're developing around me. Those things, when was the last time we actually took time to be thankful for everything in our lives? That's developing optimism, no doubt about it. So if you're not, I will say this, you will develop a ability to become feeling, I deserve this, I deserve am entitled to this. But thankful for everyday things is so important. Even in the hardest days, I have always something to be thankful for, and that's when it really matters. Always have something to be thankful for. I don't want to dwell on those things I'm lacking. Be careful. Another way is that we are to be thankful in our challenging circumstances, not just for everything. How about those challenging circumstances? Man, things that will rob us of our joy. 
doesn't always come in a specific way and fashion. That's what we're talking about. Life has a way of just really injuring us. But to be thankful in challenging circumstances, I'll tell you, you will always have God and His Word. I have told people numerous times, what scripture are you going to stand on? I actually pass it on. It almost at times become irrelevant. It's like the Bible? How does that work? But where I go back in difficult circumstances, I intentionally look for scriptures that says that God is with us, that God will empower us. Where is that verse? Where can I find that? That somehow God sees and cares for us. Oh, I love that. It's so wonderful when I see that God will accomplish something good in this. When I see that, I will grow in this. I was just sharing with Ainsley. I said, this situation that's happening, Romans chapter 5, verse 3, count it all joy when various tribulations happen. It really produces some things in you, especially character. Man, I don't see what character is going on yet, but I'm going to get there. And it says we should be happy when tough times come. We should be happy. But I'm talking to Christians these things aren't going to happen unless God transforms our lives. So important. No, my guess is that we can all grow a little bit better in being thankful in all these areas. Let's go on to number two, shall we? I think you're getting number two, practice gratitude as a representative of Jesus. Now, I like Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. Let's spring it on you. Here we go. And whatever you do, the Bible says, whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord. Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Now, this is a new concept maybe for some, but gratitude really is a witness to others. You belong to Jesus. That's a witness. Now, the Bible even says that you're a representative of Jesus Christ through God the Father. Now, that's pretty exciting. So when you demonstrate things, you not only represent Jesus to others, you represent his nature. Oh, isn't the Lord kind? Isn't he been good? He's really been very patient with you and me. You get to emulate that. You get to demonstrate that in the setting of the public. What a witness. What a representative. How would that look? Well, you can imagine with me, no real grumpy or somehow pessimistic or negative Christian how many of those attract people to Christ? I, I didn't come that way. I just saw a few that when I was beginning my journey with God, they were still talking Jesus. <laughs> and I'm telling you, they were really facing some dire situations. What a witness. So here we go. When we take a look at this. What would that look like? How do we be a, a representative of Jesus? How about in the store? When you're going through the checkout, where you just kind of politely just say, thank you, hello, that would be great. Just grateful for what somebody might do or help you with. How about the restaurant? When the waiter comes up, that person says, well, how are you doing today around your table? Wouldn't it be great to say, well, how are you doing today? What a shocker where we get a chance. Or we would just give a compliment, well done. I like giving compliments. Or sometimes I'll pass somebody and say, hey, you're doing a great job as they're cleaning up the park. Thank you. You're making a difference, I tell them. Really? They'll say, how wonderful to encourage people and show gratitude. I had a couple of people over the years of time say, well, I really don't want people at the restaurant to know that I'm a Christian because I may not really tip them. I said, please don't tell them you're a Christian. Don't do it. <laughs> And don't tip them with a track unless you give them a big amount of money. I just want to throw that as a side note. But it's very real. You know, we have some waiters and waitresses here, and they know what I mean. So it's important. How about at work? Do you practice gratitude toward your coworkers or your supervisors? You represent Jesus. What is Jesus going to be like to me? Is he stern? Does he even know I exist? Does he even acknowledge I've done something? Number three, practice gratitude for others. I like Philippians chapter 1, verse 3. Let's take a look at that. But look at this third point. This third point, practice gratitude for others. If there's any area that you lose 
our optimism. It is right in relationships. This is it. This is the big one. If you can cross on over and be grateful for people around you. Philippians 1.3 says, Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. <laughs> That's pretty neat. That would be nice to even say, I want to just thank God for you. How important is that? Let's face it. We don't always feel like that with everyone. There are people. We all have people in our lives. Do we not? You at home? Don't you have people in your life? Easily say, oh, yeah, thank God for this person. No problem. This, they're great. I can always count on them to write me a check to help bail me out. But there are areas that there could be others that are a little more challenging and we have a hard time practicing gratitude. But it's essential. This one is essential to keep us back from becoming cynical or closed off. This one's essential to learn to be thankful for people. Here's some, I'm just going to pass it on. You can write it down if you feel this is going to be a benefit to you and grow in your optimism so God can use you. Number one, avoid de demonizing people. Avoid demonizing people. You go ahead and write that down. We're not going to put that, post it. These things will help you. I can think, if I can think about that person as being ultra bad, it somehow justifies my bad behavior. So we have to be careful about that. We never want to just cause a person to just declare that they're of no value. Be careful. Another one, avoid gossip. Gossip sharing negative information to influence the listeners in one way or the other. Be careful about that. We are not, as people, entitled to be the judge of other people. Be careful about that. Watch out. Do not hurt persons character or reputation. Be careful about that. Another one, choose thankfulness as an act of love. There's literally my one way to express love is to show thankfulness to somebody. That is my effort to show love. I'll tell you, it doesn't cost me money. It may cause me to be a little humble because I really would like to say you could do more, <laughs> but I want to show love. And I want to express love. And I will not. Then I'll avoid demonizing and I'll avoid gossip would be one way to show love and gratitude. Assume a positive intention in any areas. Assume positive intentions. When people don't do what you anticipate and you've been injured, assume there's got to be a reason behind that. It's kind of like the old iceberg, right? You all heard that an iceberg, 90% of the iceberg is below the waterline. You only see 10% above the surface. When somebody hurts you, if somebody doesn't perform up to expectation, there's got to be a reason. Maybe there's something of a positive intention. Why was that motive when they went and did what they did? So important. And number four, practice gratitude for your eternity. Take a look at that one as well. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. It says, Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. Check that out for a moment. Since we are receiving a kingdom, man, we've been promised a kingdom. That's going to always keep me filled with gratitude. You got to know where you're going. That should create thankful hearts in you and me always. It's so important if we overemphasize the negative going around you in your life and in your sphere of influence, you overemphasize the bad stuff, that means overemphasize you've lost focus of your eternal kingdom. You will always have a reason to be happy. You will always have a reason to be a good witness about Jesus. The brokenness of this life should remind us, really, that this world is not forever. It's important that I even tell you this because there could be a time I'm not here to tell you that because things have so unraveled on this planet that we don't have the liberty to express the Word of God. You'll have to remember everything has been zeroed out. 
Some of you have had those in your life. What you were hoping will always be there, what you always anticipated, you were expecting in retirement, it's gone. And now, what do we have left? It just reminds us we've got an eternal kingdom. I love Hebrews 12, 20, since we are receiving a kingdom that's unshakable. I love that. That means where we're going, friends, no pandemics. Woo! No fires, glory to God, huh, huh? Yeah. No earthquakes. Hey, that's important too. No droughts, no heat waves. That's reserved for those below. Anyway, I just want to... <laughs> hey, the past 18 months, I'm telling you, has been so unpredictable and things have been so temporary. And I just, there's like this frustration that is at a heightened level. I don't need to tell you that, but when I bring it up, it's like, yeah, it sure has been. But we have an unshakable kingdom. And for a Christian, the point four is practice gratitude for your eternity. Let's not need to go to a memorial service and remember, oh, yeah, when my time comes, I think I will go to heaven. Spent almost Saturday... Uh, Rick Fagnetti's memorial service right on the beach. It was great. It was a wonderful experience. Saw good Christian friends, people I know cutting loose for God in great ways around the planet. But I'm telling you, we should have just all celebrated. We're going to join him one day. He had faith in Jesus. So it's important. I know you know that. It almost sounds like, yeah, let's move on to the next point. But I do find people have forgotten their eternal, unshakable kingdom. I like Jeremy Camp, his song, There Will Be a Day. Take a look at the lyrics of the first line. Just kind of Google that. There will be a day. Ooh, he's got it. He's got it locked in. It's really, really good. So how can we be optimistic people if we lose our profound thanksgiving and hope for heaven? I don't know. But I sure like talking about it. And I like talking with people that are geared up to go. You can tell, man, they are generous and they want to be fully engaged with what God's kingdom's all about. Number five, let's move on just a little bit. Practice gratitude in your pain. I was going to overlook this one, but I think I'll hit it. Look at Psalm 50, verse 14. We'll put it up on the screen. Make thankfulness your sacrifice to God. Wow. Wow. When does that happen? Well, it always happens when you are at that heartbreaking point. There's nothing there. You don't have an attachment to circumstances. You don't have an attachment to events or things. You have nothing to really thank God, but you're going to say, Lord, I'm going to offer you a thanksgiving as a sacrifice. That's pretty powerful. If you have gotten into that, I love to call it the evening sacrifice like King David did. Lord, these things cost me something, and somebody benefited, and they thanked me for it, and now I offer it to you as the evening sacrifice. Hmm. It came at a cost. I had to work and be there and help, and they said, thank you. Now I turn that as my evening sacrifice. It cost me something to show up and to work. Praise God. If you get to that point in your evening time, whether you kneel by your bedside or you sit and you offer God the evening side, you will feel the fire of God consume you. It's pretty beautiful. I don't want to offer God anything that doesn't cost me. That's can't really. Come on. Everything's his anyway. But it's important for us to come along. But sometimes life is so painful and it's hard to focus anything positive, but I I guess many of you have been in a place like that. It's very difficult to give thanks. You give thanks anyway. How is that possible? I just, I basically, when I take a look at one thing that doesn't change, that's what's important. Things change, evil still rampant, brokenness is out there, sin's ever present, but God himself is one thing that does not change. And his word is one thing that does not change, and that's how I come in with my evening sacrifice too. Lord, these things I was so happy with for six months, now it's gone. 
but you don't change. And I want to thank you, Lord, for you and for your word. Jesus, you're the one that said, Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall never pass away. You come in and you thank the Lord for that. Focus on his word. Focus on God. You can offer that sacrifice. Man. I love Psalm 119. Look at it. It's on the screen, 92, verse 92. If your instructions hadn't sustained me with joy, I would have died in my misery. I will never forget your commandments, for by them you gave me life. For by them you gave me what? Life. Gave me what? Life. Man, thank God for the printed word. I go there and life comes back to me. It's so easy to offer God, but if we practice gratitude in our pain, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, many of you have been zeroed out like we talked about. And when you come and say, Lord, I don't know how you're going to pull it together, but I come to you now in my pain, my lack, my loss, and you describe two things. I start to hear God again, and I'm seeing God again. Oh, man, that alone will start to cause you to be thankful. Well, praise God. Let's welcome our worship team up. Let's go to number six. Practice gratitude in your worship. There it is. You knew I was going to sneak that one in. It's a beautiful thing to be able to worship. I love Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. It says this so clearly. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts, with thanksgiving. Take a look at that. It's a Pretty much a directive. Who is it aimed to? God. I do sometimes forget. We just want the best we can around here for the audience, for you to be comfortable in the situation and the setting. Hope you like the song selection today. Hope you like the volume today. But then I realize, wait, hey, we're doing this for God. I do have people from time, I didn't like it this way or I didn't like it that way. Well. Worship's really for God. And it really doesn't matter. You know that. I'm sure of that. God created mankind to love music. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> and we relate to certain songs because certain lyrics so relatable to us. It's like, I'm there. Oh, I've lived that. Oh, I'm in it. It's my favorite song. And what a gift that is for us. I love worship that celebrates God, who he is, and what he has done. I like, this is for David Liu, I like joyful worship. I really do. I know there's contemplative and woe is me, and maybe I've sung a few funeral dirges in my life. But there's so much joy in the Lord. Mm. And that's what brought me to Jesus, was seeing people that had joy when it's like, what is that? Because I don't see any beer in their ice chest. I didn't see any weed being passed around. I honestly, I was, you are so peaceful and happy. That's why I like to make my worship joyful. That's my favorite kind of worship. Blow the cobwebs off. Someone says, I don't have enough dust to blow the fuzz off a peanut. Let's keep our joyful attitude. I want to welcome you who are with us on live stream. And I want to thank you for being with us. Maybe today you haven't been able to experience that life transformation of just joy. It really comes from Jesus. And it's so wonderful how that Romans 14, 17, the Word of God says that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's there with you right now. I want to welcome you to pray with me. And you who are with me now, you can pray to say, Lord, I need the kingdom. And I need Jesus. Because maybe what I've been lacking and the pastor's been talking about is mine today, and it's true. Would you pray with me and would you join me as well? Simple little prayer goes like this. Dear Jesus, 
I acknowledge to you today I need you and I acknowledge my desire to live for you help me almighty God to do my best and wash me clean of my sins all my shortcomings all my failures my life is yours today and it makes me so happy to know that I will live the rest of my life with you I will never be alone I will never be afraid I am completely yours and I give you thanks in Jesus name amen praise God well I want to just now bless you and thank you for joining me if you prayed that prayer would you let me know I'll come right back and describe how you can respond and be a part of this ministry here today God bless you God strength you give it all you can for Jesus you'll never be disappointed goodbye I want to thank you. you for joining us today at Hope Chapel Huntington Beach it's our desire to bring the teachings of this church to others globally. If today's message has brought you closer to Jesus, we want to know. Can you send us an email to office at hopechapelhb.org? Would you consider supporting this ministry financially? You can give securely online at hopechapelhb.org slash give. If a check is your preferred method, you can send a mailed check to Hope Chapel, P.O. Box 548, Huntington Beach, California, 92648. If you want to be contacted by Hope Chapel, would you consider subscribing to our weekly newsletters at hopechapelhb.org slash subscribe. Whatever season of life you're in, we want to go through it with you. We want to thank you once again for joining us, and God bless you.